Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's call, Mergers a Primer. At this time, I would like to go ahead and introduce our speaker today. Our speaker today is Tamara Kling. Thank you, and welcome, Tamara. Well, greetings, and thanks to everybody who's joined us. My name, as you were told, is Tamara Kling. I am an attorney with CT Corporation, and I do legal and government relations work for this company. Um, anyone who's followed the business news or the law has seen that merger activities seems to be constantly changing. The numbers and values rise and fall from year to year or decade to decade, but the structure of the transactions change as well. Um, one thing that hasn't changed, though, is the fact that merger filings have many, many details, um, and a lot of work sometimes needs to be done after the transaction. Prior to the merger, the parties begin due diligence in an in-depth investigation of the target company they search for all relevant, meaningful information. And this can take months. It can require intense analysis depending on the size and value of the target company. So due diligence asks, answers the question, should we buy? If so, how much should we pay? Um, and the lawyers then will go on to structure the transaction and include how much to pay. Um, Focuses on the due diligence and the strategic area include the strategic position of the target, finances, assets, and legal matters, some of which we are going to discuss today. So once a business decides to enter into a merger, the complicated process begins. This includes planning and completing the filings. This will make the transaction legally binding, as well as the records of the state filing office accurately reflecting all changes caused by the merger or the transaction. Failure to file required documents or neglecting any steps can result in a delayed merger, causing the loss of, you can lose such things as naming rights, there can be penalties, and you can incur additional tax liabilities. So this is just a preview of what we're going to talk about. We'll do a little bit of an overview. Then we'll look at the various types of mergers. We'll look at pre-transaction planning, which is always crucial. And then post-transaction filing issues. That's what you usually do to clean up the public record. So we're going to start with our first polling question. And Victor is here to help. OK, these are our polling questions for CLE credit. All of them need to be answered in order to obtain credit. And please answer in the pop-up box, which has just come up on your screen, not in the Q&A box. And our first polling question is, how many of you have seen the following in your merger practice over the last year? Number one, increase in the number of merger transactions. Two, a decrease in the number of merger transactions. Three, about the same number of merger transactions. And four, not applicable. OK, and again, please answer in the pop-up box that just came up, not in the Q&A box. And again, we need to answer these for CLE credit. Polling question number one, how many of you have seen the following in your merger practice over the last year? Number one, increase in the number of merger transactions. Two, a decrease in the number of merger transactions. Three, about the same number of merger transactions. Or four, not applicable. OK, we have most people have already responded here. I'm going to push the results over to you so you can see where we are, Tamara, see kind of where the audience stands. And as you can see, we have an increase, a third, a decrease, not many at all. And then about the same, another third, and then not applicable, another oh, third. So those results are interesting. And, and never fear if you chose not applicable. It's still important to know this depending upon what kind of legal practice or business you're in. So we'll have a little bit of something for everyone, I hope. And that ends polling question number one. So this is kind of interesting. It's the announced M&A activity in North America um, from 1985 to the present. And as you can see, it kind of goes up and down, and there's some dips, particularly in uh, 2009. But even so, 2009 was a bad year for a lot of companies. It was still higher than some of the earlier merger activity um, during the 80s. And, and supposedly, the 80s were um, the biggest merger activity ever. It was a big thing. But the 80s also, there were a lot more hostile takeovers and mergers that were not so always openly or happily received by the businesses. 
So here we have um, 1985 to 2017. This is in the value of the transactions, and I think that's pretty interesting as well. Um, they kind of mirror what we talked about earlier, but they generally go up except for a little bit. So when we talk about mergers, what are we saying? Well, is it the business deal, the things I talked about for due diligence and uh, why a company would want buy another company? Well, the corporations do the deal. The, they may do it for a number of reasons, gaining market share, uh, synergy, adding products, adding customer lines, reduction of costs. There's all kinds of reasons behind a merger. Um, but the price is always part of the deal, as I mentioned earlier. But the statutory merger is not the deal. That's how you get from point A to point a B. It's merely a legal device that we use to make the deal happen. Um, the deal includes what is to be acquired, and there's all kinds of things, um, and the form of consideration. It can be cash, stock, or other property, or other things. So what's an acquisition? Um, in business entity law, an acquisition occurs when one entity obtains all or part of another by one of several statutory or non-statutory means. So to have an acquisition, it necessarily it doesn't necessarily have to become uh, statutory. We've got a couple of acquisition types that I'll mention. There's the share acquisition and the asset acquisition. With the share acquisition, um, this would happen when the acquiring company, company purchases the shares or all the stock of the target company. And this is how a subsidiary can be obtained. Um, there's fewer statutory requirements such as shareholder meetings, um, and it's a simple contract between the two entities. It can be friendly or unfriendly, uh, where the acquiring company buys shares directly from the shareholders. Next is the asset acquisition. Um, that would be when the acquirer buys a company's assets, subject to the liabilities that travel with the assets, um, and it allows the buyer to pick and choose what they want. It can be a lot more complicated for accounting reasons, and assets have to be properly identified and valued. Um, you value the parts rather than the entire operation. So an example of that would be perhaps a boutique is being sold, and this rather large retailer, rather than buy the boutique outright, chooses to buy the boutique product that it has in the stores, whatever it has in the chain of the pipeline for buying new product, and maybe customer lists but it wouldn't buy stock in that boutique itself. So as I mentioned, there's two types of acquisition, the share and the asset. And now we're going to go on and look at what is a merger. Well, this is a Black's Law Dictionary definition. Um, it's a statutory device. Obviously, there were no mergers at common law. And it allows the combination of two or more business entities by the transfer of the assets, the liabilities, and businesses of all to one of them. It continues the existence of one of the entities, and the others are swallowed up or merged into the continuing entity. So at the end of the day, you can have a number of parties to a merger, but only one entity can remain. Well, the purpose of this is to show you that mergers and acquisitions, although we say them a lot together, M&A, merger activity, the terms are not interchangeable. Mergers are actually a subset of acquisitions because they are merely a way of acquiring an interest in a business. So we have some basic terminology that you will need for the rest of this presentation. There are a variety of parties to a merger. First of all, there is the acquiring company. That will be the continuing entity, the survivor generally the party that is buying another company. And the target is that company that is being purchased. It can also be called the seller, also called the disappearing entity because generally it is not going to be around after the merger takes place, merged entity or non-survivor. If you don't know who or what some company is and you know they're party to your merger, you can merely call them a constituent. All parties to a merger are called constituents or parties to the merger. Also, we're going to go into the various triangular mergers, and for that purpose, the corporations or the, the one of the parties will 
will create an acquisition sub or a merger subsidiary, and that is just an entity that is used to effectuate the merger. Well, lawyers like statutory mergers a lot. Um, the documents filed show the effect the merger. It's relatively straightforward. Um, with the contents are specified by the statute. There are non-statutory transitions of the transaction that I've mentioned, but that is a lot more uh, complex and there's a lot more contractual documents required. So it's a precise way to enter to acquire another business. It's, everything is in the statute. Um, and the results are clearly prescribed by law. We know where the parties stand after the merger, we know where the value is, and we know who is who. So there's really a clarity of effect um, prescribed by law. Um, the results include every entity but the survivor is, uh, is around, uh, only the survivor. The property vests in the survivor, and the survivor assumes the non-survivor's liabilities, and the proceedings continue against the survivor. So it's not a way of getting out of a lawsuit or, or a debt. You, the debts and the lawsuits travel with the entity itself. Also, there are dissenters' rights. The parties may be granted dissenter rights by statute, um, entitling them to receive payment of the appraised fair value of their ownership interest when an action alters the character of their investment significantly. So that can be considered as well. Um, and there's, there's an old adage that uh, statutory mergers call for more paperwork and less lawyering. And I think after you see this presentation, you may agree with that as well. There's a lot of business requirements, and there are a lot of filing requirements. So we looked, what do the statutes tell us? Well, the document, they have the contents and effects. Um, we will know where the parties are after the merger. As I mentioned, the survivor will get all the assets and liabilities. Um, and the seller shareholders or members or partners, if it's an LLC or a partnership type entity, usually receive shares or membership or some kind of right in the survivor, or they may receive cash. Also, appraisal rights may be available to minority owners who are against the merger. Next, we're going to go and we're going to look at some of the varying types of mergers. And we are now at polling question number two. Thank you, Tamara. All right, polling question number two. Please answer these questions in the pop-up box that just came up on your screen, not in the Q&A box, and these need to be answered for CLE credit. Polling question number two. In your practice, which type of merger do you handle most often? Number one, a general merger. Number two, a parent sub-merger. Number three, a triangular merger. Or number four, a multi-entity merger. Okay, please answer these for CLE credit in the pop-up box that came up on your screen, not in the Q&A box, and we are here at question number two, and it is, in your practice, which type of merger do you handle most often? Number one, a general merger. Number two, a parent submerger. Number three, the triangular merger. Or number four, the multi-entity merger. Again, just in the pop-up box that just came up, Tamara, I'm going to close the poll now. It looks like everybody's pretty much answered. And I'll push the results to you, and you can see how interesting they are. And it's sort of a uh, hyperbolic curve. <laughs> it kind of goes down there, 54, 5 to 26 to 10, and then 7, then 8. Well, that's interesting. And, and for purposes of this presentation, when we talk about a general merger, mm -hmm. we just mean that the mergers that are typically statutory. Um, and the parent submerger, that's self-explanatory. The triangular merger occurs when someone creates a merger subsidiary, and then a multi-entity merger can be between different entity types. And we're going to go over all of those as well, and all are important. So there's several types of statutory mergers. Um, as I mentioned, the general merger is affected under the general merger statutes. They're all general in the sense that they're not specific and potentially can be used for any merger. Any merger can be done under the statutes, even where there's some kind of specialty merger provision available. So ordinarily in this type of merger, the interest holders in the non-survivor, 
get interest in the survivor, generally either stock or cash. Stock if it's interest, cash if they can cash out. Then there's the parent submerger. This is the most frequently used type of specialty merger, uh, and certain statutory conditions have to be met. If that happens, then there's a shorter process that is less involved than the general. Also, sometimes they call it a short form merger because there is less work to be done. The triangular merger um, involves creating a wholly owned subsidiary of generally the acquiring corporation to facilitate a share exchange between the buyer and the seller. These mergers are also conducted under the general merger statute, but they're a little bit more involved. Uh, any of these can have more than one entity type in most states. So this is a very sophisticated drawing of what a general merger looks like. In the beginning, you have the target, and you have B, the acquiring. And B takes over A. The target merges into the acquiring company. Uh, and that's what we just saw. The target shareholders are members or their partners, and they can receive shares or interest in the acquirer. They can also get cash or other property, depending upon what the parties have agreed to. There are no special requirements. All the corporation, LLC, uh, limited partner, general partnership laws, almost all have merger statutes and provisions, and cross-merger entity mergers are allowed. The only word of caution I would have is some statutes when there are nonprofit corporations involved, they may have a higher level of scrutiny or they may not even be permitted to merge with another business corporation that's not a nonprofit itself. So what happens when these parties decide they want to have a merger? Well, the board of every party that is constituent that's part to the merger has to approve. Um, shareholders of the corporation that is the non-survivor, that is the corporation that is merging out, also have to approve. And they have to approve because their interest is changing significantly. Generally, the shareholders of the surviving entity don't have to approve. Um, there may be certain circumstances where it's required, but generally because their interests are not significantly changing, and they have elected this board of directors to act in their best interest, we presume that they would have approved it or that they understand that this can happen and therefore their special approval is not required. Uh, I won't read this to you, but this kind of shows you when approval, how it's done. Um, with corporations, it's what I've talked about. Um, for LLCs, it may be set forth in the operating agreement. Some states have a default provision requiring unanimous approval, and some states have a default rule requiring majority approval. So if you're going to be entering into a merger with a different entity type other than corporations, you will need to check the state statutes to determine how approval is given. And this is just the parent subsidiary merger, sometimes called an upstream merger when the parent is the survivor. Less popular and less frequent is the downstream merger in a case where the subsidiary survives. These are considered to be short form mergers because the procedure has been simplified. The approval of the subsidiary's board of directors is not required. Um, the theory is that the parent owns a significant amount of ownership interest in the subsidiary and therefore the subsidiary would already have voted yes. Um, and again, there's no vote required by the shareholders of the survivor uh, because there wouldn't be that much to approve for just like they have for regular mergers. So here is the parent sub upstream merger. And as you can see, the subsidiary goes into the parent and the parent survives. If you have a lot of cleanup work, you may find this in your files or in the history of a corporation. Um, sometimes corporations end up owning a host of subsidiaries and they realize the subsidiaries aren't that active, they don't want to have to do all the work required to maintain them, so rather than continue to do that, they would move the subsidiary into the parent. There might have been a good reason to have a subsidiary 10 years ago, but perhaps now it's no longer necessary. So in this kind of merger, the, the sub goes into the parent, 
It's again, it's short form. It's authorized by the business corporation laws as well as some of the other entity laws. Um, in order to do this, the parent has to have a certain percentage of ownership. Typically, it's 90%, but that can vary by state. Um, it avoids a lot of expenses, you know, proxy solicitations, meetings of a publicly traded company, um, voting. So there's a lot of things that can be avoided with this type of merger. Um, the amendment to the parent's formation document is restricted. If anything changes that would require an amendment to the parent's documents, then that too would have to take place. So it's not an end run around the statutes. The parent company can't do something that it would not ordinarily be permitted to do. And then we have the parent sub downstream merger. And in this case, we have decided that the, the subsidiary, for whatever reason, needs to exist and the parent no longer needs to exist. The sub survives, but the parent disappears. Um, in the past, this was often used to change the parent's home state. It created a mirror image subsidiary in the state where it wished to be domesticated and then just merged into that. Um, now that we have other ways of doing it, such as some states permit conversion and domestication, that's not as often used. Um, some corporation laws do permit the short form merger. Um, again, the parent has to own the requisite generally 90% of stock in the sub, and the parent's shareholders have to approve, and that's because this is a big change. If the company they own stock in will be disappearing, and they will have their stock converted to stock in another corporation, that's the kind of change that's significant enough to require some kind of approval. And if the short form uh, provision isn't available, either because it's with varying entity types or the statutes don't permit it, you can always default to the general merger statute. It, it certainly does not stop the transaction from occurring. So now we're going to talk a little bit uh, about triangular mergers. In this case, we, we form a subsidiary for the sole purpose of assisting the parent company in acquiring a target. The actual merger will take place between the sub and the target. Um, the statutes have to permit ownership interests of one constituent to be exchanged for the ownership interests of a non-constituent entity. That is always the case with triangular mergers. And this is what a triangular merger kind of looks like if you want to see it out there. You have the target company, the acquiring company, and the subsidiary. In this case, the acquiring company merges into the subsidiary, and that acquiring company becomes a sub of the target. So again, you have to create some kind of merger subsidiary. Um, so the target becomes a wholly owned subsidiary of the acquirer. But because the merger between the target and sub, the acquirer doesn't assume the target's liabilities. That's the um, benefit of buying a subsidiary rather than a whole regular merger. Um, had the target merged directly into the acquirer, the acquirer would, by law, have all the liabilities of the target, as we discussed earlier. In this case, the liabilities remain with the target slash sub. Um, the main reason for this type of merger is to allow acquiring company to acquire a target, but not um, assuming all of its liabilities. And here we have what's called the reverse triangular merger. And I'll go into that now. Um, in this case, the action is that a new merger sub is created for the transaction, like all triangular mergers. The merger sub merges into the target, and the target is the survivor. And in this case, the merger sub disappears. So really, two exchanges need to take place. The target's owner gets an ownership interest in the acquirer, and the subsidiary owners get interests in the target. This is something that's relatively new. It's developed over the past perhaps 10 years. It's called the holding company merger. It was first permitted in Delaware in 1995, and as of last month, uh, approximately 12 states had this kind of 
holding company merger. Um, it facilitates op the operating company changing itself from an operating company structure, so they don't operate anymore, they become a holding company. Um, so the holding company merger became popular because a lot of Delaware corporations wanted to change from the operating company structure to a holding company, which is a little bit different. With the holding company, you have sort of like a parent company that owns all the other companies. And typically, these companies operate independently. And so it's, a, it's an ownership interest in these different companies. But you know, a holding company can be as tightly governed or as loosely as they wish to be. Um, it can depend on the kind of companies that it owns. For instance, if you have a pharmaceutical company that owns production systems around the world, they may be very involved. Um, if all of these production systems create similar drugs, then they may be involved in, in getting some kind of bulk discount on the purchasing. But what if you have a company that owns you know, real estate and trucking and insurance, all kinds of things like that, in that case, it might be more of what we think of as a holding company structure, where each company is run individually, the operating company. Um, so with, when you have that here, the operating company merges with the sub, the holding company, and each share of the parent is converted into identical shares of the sub. So in this case, both corporations would survive, because you want the holding company, which owns all the stock of the operating company, and the operating companies, their former shareholders, get interest in the holding company. So they own a much bigger company at that point. But stockholder approval isn't required if the conditions are met. And we've talked about some of those before. You can have this in your charter, your bylaws. There can be a lot of rules regarding that. Um, I just have an example here, which is Google. In October 2015, uh, Google, quote, blew up its corporate structure and formed a company known as Alphabet. And this would allow all of its businesses to operate more effectively and efficiently. Um, Google began as a search engine and it quickly branched out. It allowed the CEO to step back from the day-to-day -day operations and focus on the big picture. Um, you know, Google had everything from internet uh, beaming hot air balloons to self-driving cars and to their own cloud system. So each division now has its own CEO. Um, they have companies such as one that builds smart thermostats, um, one that looks into healthcare and disease prevention research, and sidewalk labs, which you may have heard of, uh, which are part of innovation, an urban innovation program. And of course, there is Google LLC, which began humbly as a search engine. Um, but the rapid growth triggered a chain of products, and you know we've gone all the way now through Alexa. A more traditional operating company might be Berkshire Hathaway. You may have heard of that. It's owned by Warren Buffett. And Berkshire Hathaway owns everything from the Acme Brick Company to the Extra Corporation which engages in the sale and financing of trailer trucks. They own everything in between. They have Geico Insurance Company, Pampered Chef, Seize Candy, and a number of business-to-business -business companies, as well as Dairy Queen and Fruit of the Loom. So those are just two examples of some large, well-known holding companies, and you can see why they would want to operate under that structure. Next, we have this, what's called the two-step acquisition, and this is newer. It became law in Delaware in 2013. And the purpose is to facilitate friendly acquisitions of Delaware public corporations through a two-step transaction. The first step is the tender or the exchange offer for at least a majority of the target's outstanding shares. Then the second step is what's called a back-end merger to acquire the shares that were not tendered. Before 2013, um, back-end merger required a standard short-form threshold of 90% to avoid needing a stockholder vote. Under the law, a back-end merger is permitted without stockholder approval. Um, there are certain requirements that have to be met, including the amount of shares purchased in the first step. It has to be enough to have approval of a general merger. So there are two steps, the tender offer followed by the short-form merger. 
And in this case, the goal is for the target to become wholly owned, a wholly owned subsidiary of the acquirer. So it requires the acquirer's subsidiary to commence a tender offer for all the target shares, and it has to do this within days of signing the merger agreement. So this is a pretty fast track thing. Um, the timing advantage is the acquirer make the tender offer without prior SEC review. Um, it's two steps. Um, it can be all cash, and it can be completed in as little as 30 to 40 days. If it cannot require this, sometimes this isn't just feasible because there is too much regulatory approval required. Then you would have to default to the traditional merger. Next, we have the multi-entity merger. I've mentioned that a little bit already. That would be a case where it would be mergers just like we've discussed, although the entities would be different. Um, you may have an LLC merging into a corporation. That would be a multi-entity merger. Or you could have a number of LLCs that are merging into a corporation. So they're a merger between a different entity type. Um, sometimes these are also called cross-entity mergers, inter-entity, or even interspecies mergers. Um, typically, you'll hear cross-entity or multi-entity merger. Um, and it can be used as a vehicle to change entity forms, as well as a vehicle to acquire an entity. But there are some things to think about. Um, the domestic statutes of the state they have to be examined for each constituent. Not all states are, um, not all states have every business entity law in conformance with the others. So in some states, perhaps, a corporation is allowed to merge with an LP, but the LP law has not been updated to allow an LP to merge into a corporation. So that's something to be considered. At CT, we deal with a variety of states, and some will say, no, we will reject that merger. Well, others will say, well, it looks like the intent of the law was to allow uh, an LP to merge into a corporation, and therefore we will permit it. Um, so again, you have to look to the state statute. The manner of adoption can differ by entity type, as can the execution requirements. One thing that can be a little tricky is determining how the ownership interest will be exchanged. You know, we know what stock is, we know what an LLC membership is, but how do you translate one into the other to get something fair that the owners will agree to? We do have some recent statutory trends. Um, statutes have been enacted in some states to address these differences um, between mergers and different entity types. Some are based on the Uniform Law Commission's Model Entity Transaction Act that was just adopted in Indiana as of January 1st of this year. Um, an inter-entity merger procedure set forth in a single statute for all filing entity types instead of separately in each entity type by governing statute. So what that means is that there is the, what often states will call the Entity Transaction Act, and it will just talk about the various mergers or transactions that can occur, and then you may have to default to the corporation or the LLC statute for any specifics. Conversions are also something we need to talk about. It's just a single entity transaction, and it allows an entity to change its, itself. It can change from, for instance, a corporation to an LLC. It's also used to change the home state of the entity, and it's now being called domestication by a number of states. So the terms that we would use are the converting and the converted or resulting entity. Um, generally, it, uh, the entity is in existence without interruption, but in a new form or possibly new jurisdiction. So all property owned by the converting entity continues to be owned by the new entity. Um, and pending procedures, uh, proceedings by or against the converting company will continue. Again, it's not a way to get out of litigation or debts or contracts. The procedure generally requires management to adopt a plan of conversion, and then that will be approved by the owners. Um, according in Delaware, it has to be approved in a manner provided for in the formation or governing documents. And in that case, for instance, let's say you want to um, convert a Delaware corporation to an LLC, 
you would file a certificate of conversion, and then you would need to file a second document for the LLC formation. So the conversion certificate announces to the state and to the world that this transaction is taking place, but every entity needs some kind of formation document, and for an LLC, it would be a certificate of formation. Next, we're going to look at pre-transaction planning. There's a lot of things that you need to do before the merger, and I'll, I'll say it a few times, but the best way is to find out when the merger is scheduled to take place, and then work backwards with all the work you have to do. So a lot of issues need to be concerned. The parties that are part of the merger have to be in good standing. Um, the states will reject filings for entities that are not in good standing. Um, if they aren't, they have to be returned to good standing. So you need to make sure all the constituents are in good standing in their state of formation but also in the states where they are qualified as foreign entities. So that generally means duly formed or qualified, um, then all fees, taxes, filings, and reports are up to date. So that would what good standing would be. Um, in most states, you would file a document uh, returning to good standing and correcting all of the things that were out of date or the filings that had not been made or paying taxes that were owed. Um, in some states, uh, reinstatement is not required, uh, is not permitted, and the dissolved or revoked entity would actually have to form or qualify anew. I like this slide because it gives you an idea of what all the potential complexities are. Um, there's multi-state filings. You know, you may have two parties to the merger, and they may be both in Delaware, but perhaps both of them are qualified in 20 or 30 other states. So that has to be looked through. Um, with a multi-entity transaction, it can be even more complicated because you have to check the statutes carefully to make sure that can happen. Timing is critical. You want to make sure that you are up to date with all your filings at the time of the merger. And you have to have good organizational skills. Planning, planning, planning is really your best defense against confusion. So your first question is, the constituent entities, those that are party to the merger, where are they? Well, you have to know who they are. Is there more than two? You have to know that. You have to know their home states, and then you have to make sure that they are in good standing. Then you have to check where they are qualified, make sure they were properly in good standing in their foreign jurisdictions. And if not, all the delinquent reports have to be filed. There may be fees to pay, taxes due, and that can take a while. Um, remedying these delinquencies does not happen overnight. So that's why it's also crucial to know when the merger will take place so that you have enough time to do everything or to perhaps alert people that um, it may take longer than expected. So the good standing status, I've talked about that already. Um, if the entity has been revoked, you have to reinstate. Um, if not, you may have to requalify or form again. Um, reinstatement relates back. If you have the privilege of reinstating, then the law will treat the entity as if it had been in good standing the entire time. But they may lose naming rights. Um, a corporation or an LLC may only be able to have a name for a certain period of time and if it's not in good standing, it will lose that name. And corporations and business entities oftentimes have a very strong emotional attachment to their name, and they don't want another company out there using it. So tax status is also important. You will have the surviving and the non-surviving entities, and you need to determine if they have any kind of outstanding taxes. Um, this is particularly important for entities that will no longer exist after the merger, as most states don't want their entities disappearing while they still owe taxes or money due. And there's two basic ways of achieving this. There is a status certificate. Um, many re uh, jurisdictions would only require that the entity's tax status be good, uh, meaning the entity has no taxes due, but that just means it doesn't have any taxes due at the moment. They could certainly be incurred prior to the actual merging out. 
Um, and then some states have what they call tax clearance. This is a higher hurdle. Um, it can take time to meet this. It has to be done in advance. And with this, the tax department gives a former letter of clearance saying that they are completely paid up of any money that is due and owed or will be due and owed um, in a certain period of time. So now we are on to polling question number three. All right. Thank you, Tamara. And again, this is for CLE credit. We need to answer all these questions. Please answer in the pop-up box that just came onto your screen. Polling question number three, do you generally assume tax liability during your merger instead of obtaining cl tax clearances? Number one is yes. I think Tamara's just speaking about this. Number two, no. Polling question number three, do you generally assume tax liability during your merger instead of obtaining tax clearances? The choices are one yes and two no. And again, please answer in the pop-up box, not the Q&A box. And this is uh, one more time for CLE credit. Do you generally assume tax liability during your merger instead of obtaining tax clearances? Number one, yes. And number two, no. All right. I think we've all answered no. I'm going to close the poll and send you the results, Tamara, and you'll see that uh, we have a winner. Uh, number two, no, 61%. Okay. Well, I'm going to talk about assumption of liability right now, and it can be a good idea, but it is not always available. So assumption of tax liability can avoid the need for tax clearance um, by having the survivor assume the liability of all the other constituents. It sort of goes, reflects the reality that after the merger, only one entity will exist, and it will certainly be responsible for all future current and future taxes due. Um, this can be very helpful in some states. It takes a long time to get a certificate of tax clearance. Um, and states generally uh, permit some kind of assumption, but they may require the assuming entity to be a domestic or a foreign qualified entity. So an entity that has no relationship with the state is less likely to be able to assume liability of taxes. Another matter of concern with pre-transaction planning is name issues. Um, almost every business entity law provides that an entity can only use an available name, uh, and it can't conflict with the current names on the state record used by other entity types. So you should check the availability of the name. Maybe your survivor will be qualified in an additional state. Well, you want to make sure that survivor can use their name. Um, and names can be protected in a few ways. And there's special merger concerns. Um, the survivor may want the name of the non-survivor, or perhaps they want to combine the name. So you may have to search for more than one name. Um, the merger can result in the survivor uh, in a different type of business or location. They may want to change their name for that reason. So it's best to determine the new name availability in the states where you will be actually doing business including the home state. And this is just a little information on how to check name availability. Um, it can be done on the phone or online. Some states require a request. Um, but remember, even if it's available on the records, another party can have a superior right under federal or state trademark law. You don't want to get a cease and desist letter from the name holder who has superior rights. We also recommend a trademark search just to make sure that it isn't being used in other ways. The states have a few name availability standards. Um, the most common now is distinguishable upon the record. And that merely means the states have a bunch of rules that say what is and is not distinguishable. Does a plural make it distinguishable? Does a number make it distinguishable? There's all kinds of rules, so just because it's one character different doesn't mean it will necessarily be considered distinguishable. So you have to find out what the rules are for the state. Um, and then there's deceptively similar. That's a, a harsher standard. It's a harder standard to meet. Um, and basically they're saying is there's not a likelihood of confusion um, of the new name with existing names. The name reservation is the most uh, commonly used device. What it does, it allows you to protect your name. 
Um, it gives short-term protection for a name filed at the state filing office, usually 30 to 120 days. Um, some, some states permit renewal, but not always. So it's important to calendar that to make sure that if the name reservation ends, that you can re-reserve it or reserve it a second time or third time. Now there's name registration. Um, it's generally one year plus renewable terms. Um, and that gives greater protection to a legal name for a business in foreign jurisdictions where it hasn't qualified to do business. Um, it requires a certificate of existence or good standing from the home state. So it's not really just a way of saving a name that you think you might want. It's a way for an existing business entity to protect its name in other states. Um, one word of caution. Some uh, businesses think that if they register the name, then they have the right to do business there. But name registration and foreign qualification are two different things, and name registration does not provide any kind of qualification. So this is just sort of a general reminder of when you would use the reservation system and when you would want to use a name registration. You may get questioned about, uh, what about domain names? You know, you have abc.com, what's going to happen to that? Well, in determining name availability, uh, most states disregard the .com or the .net or whatever the ending is. So you may want to search the name name register um, to see if it's been used and under your name availability check and as a trademark issue. And what can you do if the name is not available? Um, one thing, you can obtain written consent of the name holder. In that case, it has to be permitted by the statute and that the name holder has to agree that they will switch that name as soon as possible. Um, then there's a conflict name. This is sometimes called a fictitious name. So if you want to do business in another state, and your real true name from your state of domestication is not available, then you would have to qualify under a fictitious name. And then we also have the issue of voluntary assumed name. In many states, an entity can voluntarily use a name under than, other than their true name. You know, maybe they have a long corporate name, but they want their public-facing name to be a little bit more uh, memorable or understandable. So don't confuse a conflict name, which means your name isn't available, with a voluntary assumed name, which is generally used more for business purposes. Um, to make this even more difficult, some states confuse them or call them by two different concepts. Um, so you'll have to check your state statutes and find out what is required. Now we are at polling question number four. Great. Thank you, Tamara. Polling question number four, again, please answer in the pop-up box, not in the Q&A box, and these need to be answered for CLE credit. And this question is, when a business entity client needs to qualify as a result of a merger, when do you generally file the qualification documents? Number one, before filing the merger documents. Number two, at the same time as the merger documents. Number three, after filing the merger documents. And again, this is for CLE credit. They need to be answered. Answer in the pop-up box. When a business entity client needs to qualify as a result of a merger, when do you generally file the qualification documents? Number one, before filing the merger documents. Number two, at the same time as the merger documents, and number three, after filing the merger documents. I think we have almost everybody here has responded once again to us. And again, this is for CLE credit. Please answer in the pop-up box. I'm going to close the poll now. And Tamara, I'm going to send you the results. And you'll be able to see where our attendees are weighing their answers. Okay. Well, it looks like the majority either qualify um, before filing the merger documents or at the time of merger. Ideally, we would like to qualify at the time of merger so that you're not qualified a, a day sooner than you need to be, but the problem is that can involve a lot of filing and a lot of work, so sometimes people like to do it earlier. <laughs> 
Um, so what you have to ask yourself before you qualify, is this entity going to be engaging in what a state would call business activities? And that can be hard to determine. It's, it's usually a legal determination made by counsel. So it requires knowledge of both the business activities that the entity will be engaging in, um, and then the relevant statutes, case law, and even administrative opinion. So there's a lot to look into. You know, you don't want to qualify if you don't have to. You don't want to incur uh, taxes and other obligations. But if you are qualified, if you are required to follow, qualify, then you want to certainly make sure that you do so. When a merger takes place, um, the survivor is generally not qualified in the states where the non-survivor have been qualified. So you will have to qualify in that case, and sometimes that takes a lot of research as well. So when do you qualify? Well, one of the best things to do is to take advantage of delayed filing statutes. Many statutes say that you can file a document up to 90, 90 days before the effective date. So you can have it effective on the date that you want to have the merger effective. Of course, if that changes, you will need to amend those documents. Um, another thing that can be of help is preclearance, where you pay and have the state guarantee that they will file that document, um, barring no unforeseen changes within a certain period of time. Um, and then the, lastly, there is also expedited filing. And you may want to do this at least with your um, regular merger documents. You want the merger to take place on a certain day. So if you file it, you can have it pre-cleared. And then if you expedite it, you can have it, you are paying to have it filed within a certain period of time on a certain day or date. So as I mentioned, there can be, pay, there can be penalties for failure to qualify. And of course, if you're not required and you do so, you will incur um, additional fees that you'll be required to pay. So there's all kinds of timing issues. I, I won't read this to you, but this shows everything that's concerning uh, timing. Um, and an, another timing issue is abandonment. What if you no longer wish to have that merger take place? Well, if you have filed your documents and you've had preclearance with a delayed effective date, you want to make sure that the statute allows you to abandon that. Um, and another reason the statutes allow abandonment is they want to have a penalty clause uh, to eliminate bid shopping. So maybe technically you're allowed to abandon a merger, but then in your merger pre-merger documents you'll have something uh, with a penalty. Authentication uh, can also be an issue with international transactions. I won't read that to you, but it's something to keep in mind. Um, another thing to keep in mind is the Hart-Scott-Rodino Act. Um, that's an amendment to the Antitrust Act, which says during a filing period, federal agencies have the right to review the transaction for antitrust law violations. Um, the filing fee can be rather steep. Um, it can be $45,000 per transaction. It's generally paid by the acquiring company. And this triggers a 30-day waiting period where the government can look at uh, examine the, the merger for anti-competitive concerns. Um, as I mentioned, it's $45,000 per transaction, uh, which is steep, but um, the um, failure to file, if you were required to, also can be very steep. There can be very large penalties. And that just gives you a little bit more about it. Uh, we're coming to the end of our presentation, but we have gotten through all the important things. We've talked about getting organized, I've got a little bit more of that, kind of a summary of what we've said. And then I am going to talk about the primary merger document. These are what's necessary to have the actual merger take place that you file in the state filing office. They're drafted in the pre-transaction phase. Uh, the content is set forth from the statutes. Um, and so take care to check the statutes and the entity types. Um, it has the manner and basis of converting the ownership interests of each business entity into the ownership of the survivor or cash or property. Um, kind of to review, the approval varies by entity um, and type. 
Um, the corporations, the board of directors of each party has to approve, and the shareholders of the disappearing company. In some states, the articles or certificate of merger have to contain the plan of merger or there will be a form that asks for some abbreviated information. But the contents requirements will vary by state and by statute. And then lastly, there are some post-transactional filing issues you have to think about. What about all the states where the disappearing company was qualified? Do you need to withdraw from that? The constituent no longer exists. And then you also have to consider what states the surviving company wishes to do business. So there's a number of filings that can be revolved doing with this uh, to remove the entity from the record or to qualify a new entity. And this just gives you an idea. You know, it varies. Some states say that you can file evidence of the merger or you can formally withdraw where the non-survivors are qualified. Um, again, you'll have to qualify the survivor where it wishes to do business, and we've talked about that. Um, there may be name changes required, and there's various state filing requirements. So these are some of the issues that come up. You know, what do you file when both the surviving and non-surviving are qualified? Uh, do you file something different if only one party is qualified? So there's a lot of different permutations that you have to be ready for. If you don't withdraw and you should, again, you can, it's just like qualifying when you don't need to. There can be fines, penalties, taxes, um, and continuing liability for filings. And these are some of the additional potential problems. We've talked about this previously. Um, sometimes a document can be corrected. Um, generally, if a document contains information that wasn't correct, um, it can be changed, but it's generally restricted to, um, for instance, technical matters, um, an inaccuracy, a number was incorrect, um, defective ex execution. Generally, substantive matters have to be amended. A, a correction document is not permitted. So this just tells you what is in the Articles of Correction. And then I always like to end with common reasons for rejected filings. I won't read this to you, but I think this just gives you a good idea of how many how things can go wrong and all the things that you have to concern yourself about prior to filing. And then in summary, we've talked about a lot of things. We've talked about the definition what mergers are, um, what an asset acquisition, what a, a stock acquisition is, the various kinds of merger transactions, um, what has to be done before the merger, and what has to be done after the merger. Um, everyone, if you have asked any questions in the sidebar, I will review those questions and we will send everyone, everyone who's actually been on this this everyone who's participated, you will get a copy of all the questions and the answers that we have provided. So we're completed this part of the seminar, and I am now going to turn it over to Amanda. Thank you, Tamara, and thank you everyone for attending.